chapter 5. Why do I want you to read that? Answer. Because when Calvin got to Geneva, there were some people already there. Not only were there some people already there, but the Reformation had started. And this is an incredible chapter on some astonishingly vivacious women. One of whom, I, you've got to say, before Calvin got there, all hell broke loose in Geneva. The Protestants were running around trying to smash statues, and the Catholics were running around trying to defend statues. Very, very interesting. Very, very exciting. <clears throat> There's a story of a woman who heard a Protestant preacher come to Geneva. She was so astonished by what he had to say. She went to Google and she stayed to listen. And then she borrowed somebody's Bible and she locked herself up in her room for a long time. Read the New Testament all the way through, came out, converted, and then began to preach. Interesting. So, anyway, this Jane Dempsey Douglas, uh, Women, Freedom, and Calvin, will give you an insight into some of the people who are actually here before before Calvin. We are, we are going to have a mild read and diplomatic reading today. Now we're going to overlook how to hear that, how he got to the Navy. Uh, we can't say Calvinism that he got there by accident. That would be a mistake. But he thought he was going there by accident. There was a war going on. He got to the by accident. He thought, and he was going to leave, and far rail. Very interesting guy. William Farrell said to Calvin, you're going to stay and help me with the Reformation in Geneva. He said, no, I'm not. And the reason I'm not is because I'm shy and I'm a scholar and I want to write my books and I don't want to get involved in things like that. And then Farrell said, remember what God did, what God said to Jonah, what God did to Jonah. Calvin was so terrified, he stayed. What the, what the name? Calvin gets to Geneva in 1536 and is kicked out in 1538. Delighted to go. He said he hated it. And now he could go ahead and have a quiet life. And then Bootser from Strasbourg said to Calvin, I want you to come to Strasbourg and help me with the Reformation there. And what was that? 1538. Okay. And uh, Calvin said, no, I'm shy, I'm a scholar, I'm temperamental, and uh, I'm not fit for this kind of stuff, and I'm not going to do it, and uh, I need a pen so we can welcome Eleanor Morgan. Hello, Eleanor. Well, Sorry, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. uh, so, the same thing. Uh, Bootser said, if you don't stay, God's going to curse the quiet life that you like, that you want for yourself. And Calvin was so terrified, <laughs> he stayed in Strasbourg for three years, found himself a wife. Unfortunately, it's a very sad story. All of his children were born dead. Mm. So he had no children of his own. But his wife had been married before. And uh, so Calvin, uh, Calvin took care of those kids. And then, in 1541, the people of Geneva found out they couldn't get along with him with Count Calvin, and they begged him to come back. And he said, no, I don't want to come back. I've been very happy at Geneva. My wife's very happy rather than Strasbourg. My wife is happy at Strasbourg and all that. But he felt he had to go. And there is a symbol in the Reformed Church. I don't know if they, if they float this around uh, uh, Geneva now, but it's an outstretched hand with a burning heart on it. And this is a symbol for Calvin. And my, uh, he said to God, I give you my heart. I don't want to go back, but I will. Let's have Miles, let's have Miles read that now. Are you ready, Miles? <laughs> Make, 
Make, make believe that you're back with NBC. <laughs> and uh, this is from. This, this is one of the few autobiographical texts that we have in God. I said to you before that Luther and I have big mouths, and there's nothing about us you don't know. Calvin is very, very resonant. But in his commentary to the Psalms, there is a very, very important autobiographical statement. And Miles is going to do it for you. And in the Psalms, he's sort of fooling around in the Psalms with comparing himself with David. Now, he doesn't want to go that far. I'm not really as good as David. And yet, David and I have had some, some experiences in common and so on, so he really does want to compare himself to David, but he doesn't want to be too immodest. You get the point. Now, the diagrammatic reading, <laughs> and when you do this, you know what is converted, you flop. <laughs> Go ahead. He goes without saying that my own position is far below the table. Yet as he was elevated from the sheepfolds to the highest position of authority, so God took me also from the obscure and small beginnings and honored me with the office of herald and minister of the gospel. My father intended me as a young boy for theology, but when he saw that the science of law made those who cultivated wealthy, he was led to change his mind by the hope of material gain. Very good. Stop for just a moment. You will remember when you read the Vendel. Uh, that he did start out at the University of Paris studying theology. His father worked for the cathedral chapter at Noyon in France. We must get the correct accent. Noyon. Is that right? Noyon. Excellent. <laughs> As I told you last time, my French is really terrible. My mother-in-law was French. And she said to me uh, once, Vous parlez français comme une vache espagnole. Which was truly translated, you speak French like a Spanish cow. <laughs> and uh, that's an insult between vache, which is cow, and basque, which is the region of France and Spain, where the accent is bad. So, non, non. He was born there in 1509. His father worked for the bishop. So uh, he was able to get money for young Calvin to uh, study. And also, this is very, very important, too. They, they themselves were not all that rich, but he was able to play around with the rich, kid, uh, with the rich kids. And so there is a certain aristocratic demeanor to Calvin's life. He's not the peasant that Martin Luther was. So. <laughs> we have some more bass in the voice. The important thing, while he was a student, he studied under the greatest uh, expert in Latin in the country, Cordier. <laughs> Cordier, C-O-R-D-I-E-R, that's in your Vendel book. And I expect you to know that. And then the greatest expert in Greek, Volmar, who was a Lutheran. That's interesting. And, uh, and then one of the great professors of law, and so on. So, uh, go ahead. You're, you are doing very, very well. Have you ever thought about full time church work? No. Like Jim from Murphy Brown. I've never watched her. <laughs> You'll never be vice president. Keep on going. <laughs> so it happened that I was called back from the study of philosophy to learn law. I followed my father's wish and attempted to do faithful work in this field. See, this is very important. Luther also studied for law. That's important. And the reason that Luther's kid, uh, that, that uh, young Martin, was sent off to law school is because... Old Hans, Luther's father, thought that becoming a lawyer makes you rich. And there will be somebody to take care of me in my old age, said Luther's father, which is why I sent my kid to law school. Continue. 
But God. I beg your pardon. Most of your favorite lines, isn't it? But God? Yes. Oh, yes. And this is very important. But God, by the secret leading of his providence, turned my course another way. First, when I was too firmly addicted to the papal superstitions to uh -huh. Get that word, superstition. So I'm talking about that. That last time. This reformation is a reformation against what they regarded as superstition. And uh, therefore, worship is very, very important uh, in his life. And Pharrell felt the same way. And uh, Ulrich Zwingli felt the same way. And uh, Erasmus, somewhat that way. Okay. First, when I was too firmly addicted to the papal superstitions, to be drawn easily out of such a deep mire by a sudden conversion. Ah, a more emphasis on sudden conversion than important. And even to the sudden conversion, yeah, he's just talking about sudden conversion later. Oh. Go it's too early for a sudden conversion. All right, go ahead. Um, he brought my mind, already more rigid than suited my age, to submission to him. I was so inspired by a taste of true religion, and I burned with such a desire to carry my study further, that although I did not drop other subjects, I had no zeal for them. In less than a year, all who were looking for a purer doctrine began to come to learn from me, although I was a novice in the beginner. Then I, who was by nature a man of the country and a lover of shade and leisure. All right, let me stop you just one moment. This is a very, very important point. I think he was probably, I think he probably had his sudden conversion around in the year 1534. And I'll explain why I think this later. By 1535, he had already written the first edition of the Institutes. It's astonishing. Now, the first edition of the Institutes was a little bit. He kept adding. He never took anything away from it. He just kept adding. But something incredible that by that time he already regarded himself as a spokesperson for the whole Protestant movement. That is amazing. He had to leave France. He was in trouble with the Roman Church. But if you're reading, I want to remind you again one must not assume that before 1534 he was a Protestant in the full sense of the word. Are you aware that there was a very early reform movement in France? And the French love to talk about this, don't they, Marion? Yes. Because they like to have somebody as early as Luther. Right. And Calvin isn't. And the great name here is... No, you haven't done your reading, I see. Who was a great French humanist who wanted to reform Erasmus? He was not French, <laughs> but he was a great humanist. He was Dutch, but was ashamed of the fact. Lefebvre de Tops. L E F E V R E. The apostrophe. E T A T L E S. And what was his Latin form? I'm just letting you know what you should have known. Say the name again. Lefebvre de Tops. Would you like to say it in good French? Once more, the favorite de top. Once more, the favorite de top. The favorite de top. One of the great French humanists. That's right. The greatest of the French humanists. That he what? Erasmus. Oh, Erasmus lived in Bob.
Some people argue that this Lefebvre stressed grace as much as Martin Luther, and the French really push this. In Latin, his name is, and I'll spell it, F-A-B-E-R, S-T-A-P-U-L-E-N, S-I-S, F-A-P-E-R, S-T-A-P-U-L-E-N-S-I-S. And he, have any of you, aside from our friend from uh, Basel, have any of you ever heard about this guy before? Too bad. Very important movement. Where have you been educated? Very, very important movement. He also had a lot of students around him. He was, this was part of the reform, the humanistic reform movement who wanted to reform the church from within. And he got involved another guy, Brissonnet, N-N-E-T, like who became bishop, and only the French could do this, of a city called Mo, but spelled It's easy to read French. It's not easy to speak it, right, Mary? <laughs> and there, there a whole reform movement got started in France. And one of the young men involved in this reform movement was Farrell. Trying to put everybody together here. And... Uh, Maybe as time goes on, we might say something about that uh, later. But this guy is really terribly, terribly important. And of course, lies in Calvin's background too, because probably when Calvin had to leave France and go to Basel, uh, or even earlier than that, when he had to leave France, one of the reasons he had to go was because he was too much connected with this Movement. This is before he became a Protestant in the complete sense. So, yeah. What's the date of this Reformation? Yeah, I'm going to give that to you in a moment. I've got a whole text on this, but go ahead. Keep reading. Yep, keep reading. Then I, who was by nature a man of the country and the lover of shame and leisure, wished to find for myself a quiet hiding place, a wish which has never yet been granted for me. For every retreat I found became a public lecture room. When well, the one thing I prayed was obscurity and leisure, God fastened upon me so many cords of various kinds that He never allowed me to remain quiet, and in spite of my reluctance, dragged me into the limelight. I left my own country and departed for Germany to enjoy there, unknown, in some corner, the quiet world beyond me. But lo, while I was hidden, unknown at Basel, a great fire of hatred. France had been kindled in Germany by the exile of many godly men from France. To quench this fire, wicked and lying rumors were spread, cruelly calling the exiles Anabaptists and seditious men, men who threatened to upset not only religion, but the whole political order with their perverse madness. I saw that this was a trick of those in the French court, not only to cover up with false slanders the shedding of the innocent blood of holy martyrs, but also to enable the persecutors to continue with the pitiless slaughter. Therefore, I felt that I must make a strong statement against such charges, for I could not be silent without treachery. This was why I published the Institutes, to defend against unjust slander my brothers whose death was precious in the Lord's sight. Imagine this kid completing it in 1535. And it was published, the first edition was published in 1536, and really went everywhere. Okay. A second reason was my desire to arouse the sympathy and concern of people outside, since the same punishment threatened many other poor people. And this volume was not a thick and laborious work like the present edition. It appeared as a brief... 
The N Caridian, what is it, a notebook or something like that? Well, it's going to be the guy here. He rests for the whole book, so that's why we know it's a bit too. It had no other purpose than to bear witness to the faith of those whom I saw criminally liable by wicked and false courtiers. I desired no fame for myself in it, and I planned to depart shortly, and no one knew that I was the writer of the book. For I had kept my authorship secret and intended to continue to do so. But Wilhelm Farrell forced me to stay in Geneva. Guillaume Farrell. Uh, did you say it correctly, please? Hmm? Yeah, that's correct. Guillaume Farrell? Uh, uh, <laughs> I can only regard it as well. So I got Guillaume Farrell. <laughs> Save me from the jaws of one never okay, go ahead. But Guillaume Farrell forced me to stay in Geneva, not so much by advice or urging as by command, which had the power of God's hand laid violently upon me from heaven. Since the wars had closed the direct road to Strasbourg, I had meant to pass through Geneva quickly and had determined not to be delayed there more than one night. A short time before, by the work of the same good man, Farrell, and of Peter the array, the papacy had been banished from the city. But things were still unsettled, and the place was divided into evil and harmful factions. One man, who has since shamefully gone back to the papists, took immediate action to make me known. Then Farrell, who was working with incredible zeal to promote the gospel, bent all his efforts to keep me in the city. And when he realized that I was determined to study in privacy in some obscure place and saw that he gained nothing by entreating, he descended to curse it and said that God would surely curse my peace if I held back from living hell at a time of such great need. Terrified by his words and conscious of my own timidity and cowardice, I gave up my journey and attempted to apply whatever gift I had in defense of my faith. Thank you. Very, very good. That's what happened. The Reformation had started in Geneva before Calvin got there. But you can't have a Reformation just by running around smashing idols. You have to do other things too. And Farrell had all he could do to try to get this thing going. And so he begged Calvin to stay, and Calvin refused, and then he began to curse him. <laughs> and uh, told him if he didn't, uh, you know, terrible things would happen. And Calvin was so scared by all of this that he said, Yes. Is this 1541? This is 1536. This is the first time he comes to Geneva. The first time Calvin in Geneva, 1536. He stays there for two years. I want to say one other thing about Calvin's background. The biggest thing available on Calvin's life is by a Swiss scholar by the name of Dumer. D-O-U-M-E-R-G-U-E, -E, Dumer. You will notice in some of your, it's a seven volume thing, enormous, just enormous. Never been translated into English. The problem with it is that he likes Calvin more than anybody should. I mean, I like Calvin, but this guy really goes wild. I mean, he <coughs> like Calvin against everything. And Dumer, when you look back on Calvin's life, he reflected upon the providential preparation that Calvin had for his life's work. Driven out of Noyon by illness that was sweeping the country, Calvin, Paris was led to find Cordier, C-O-R-D-I-E-R, -E Cordier, the best Latin teacher in the land. Then when he went to Orléans to study law, Bolmar, W-O-L-M-A-R, the best teacher of Greek. The Middle Ages provided him with the Collège de Montaigu to sharpen his dialectical powers. The New Age, this was a humanistic college, supplied him with the Collège de France to instruct him in languages and the critical techniques of humanism. Incredible education. The Roman Church exposed her abuses to him, and for a while, uh, kept him in jail. And then this. I wish I could have been a mouse in the wall to have heard this conversation. 
Calvin, at one point, went to visit Lefebvre de Papua, Faber Stoppelensis himself, who was being protected, now get this, by the sister of the King of France who was supporting the reform movement. The French king was Francis I, Roman Catholic. His sister, Marguerite d'Angoulême, Marguerite d'Angoulême. Calvin went to her court, which at this time was in the town of Nairac, N-E-R-A-C, and he met the Fervor de Tau. The American Calvin scholar John D. McNeil supposes, he doesn't know, but supposes that it was this meeting with old Lefebvre, who was at that point a hundred years of age, who mayor goes mad and said that he prolonged his life to a hundred years just so Calvin could meet him. I mean, that's a bit far-fetched, even for one who believed in double predestination. <laughs> and it was after that conversation that Calvin went home to Noyon, resigned the benefices, the living that his father had arranged for him, really began to act as a Protestant outside the Roman Church. And John T. McNeil supposes, we don't know, that the old man, Lefebvre de Tavre, said, look, I'm a hundred years old. I have tried for years to reform the Roman Church from within, and I have failed. I therefore encourage you to get out. We don't know that that's the case, right? You're all with me. But nevertheless, it was after this meeting that Calvin went home, re resigned uh, the money he was getting from the Roman Church. This was in 1534, and became an active participant, not just in the reform movement within the Roman Church, but the Protestant movement outside of the Roman Church because maybe Lefebvre had said, there's no way, there's no way you can work within this institution. A lot of people have found that out before and since. <laughs> but anyway, so do Mary when he talks about the providential preparation that Calvin got studying under Cordier, the best Latin teacher, under Volmar, the best teacher of Greek, uh, the Collège de France to uh, teach him humanism. Uh, the great scholar Lefebvre prolonged his life to 100 years in order to give the young scholar his blessing. Finally, he was ready. The institutes were the result, so says Dumaire. One scholar says, this I fear is to out Calvin Calvin in deciphering the, the decrees of the providence of God. But nevertheless, here is a remarkable convergence of training, genius, and opportunity, which produced the first edition of the Institutes. And Farrell had heard about this. And when Calvin went through Geneva on his way someplace else because of a war, Pharrell heard he was there and made him stay. You ask about some of the dating for Le Ferre de In 59, he came out with a book on the Psalms which greatly influenced Luther. Luther read this guy. Pardon? That's right, the year Calvin was born. He translated the New Testament into French. And 
his humanistic scholarship got him into all kinds of hot water with the Roman church. But he had lots of students. One of them, Brissonnet, who became Bishop of Meaux and had a reformed diocese in France as long as he could with bright young scholars such as Farrell. Find out more of this in the Bendel book in more detail. And uh, for next time, you can also look at this Ben Dempsey Douglas chapter, a chapter of Women's Freedom in Calvin, and see what happened uh, in the Geneva Church before Calvin got there. Oh, we were still talking about reading. Sometime when you get time, uh, as a background for my lecture, I want you all to go to L. Go right straight to L. <laughs> and look at L5. Carlos M. N. I. True piety begets true confession, Calvin's attack on idolatry. And skip down two more. These are just articles in the George book. Hughes, Oliphant, Old, John Calvin, and the Prophetic Criticism of Worship. Be reformed, use the passages from the Old Testament, Amen. I hate, I despise your sacrifices. And apply them to the Roman Church, <laughs> not making the Roman Catholic exactly happen. But if you look at L5 and L7, that will get you started, and once again, we will discuss B2 next time. Any comments and questions on that? Last last week I had assigned uh, for you to read when you get around to it, A1, 2, 4, and 5, a good part of which you have just read. Comments or questions? Okay. May I go ahead that, with that brief little nothing? I know, I feel the same way. I told you last time that the Parthian movement, the Neo-Orthodox movement, uh, helped to carry, helped to carry a renaissance of Luther and Calvin studies along. And from now and then, and now and then, I want to point out to you certain points of contact between Karl Barth and this Neo-Reformation or Neo-Orthodox movement or crisis theology movement or whatever you want to call it, and Calvin himself, because in a very conscious way, Barth returned to Luther and Calvin to battle against the whole liberal movement of the 19th century. And our friend Wilhelm Pauk said Bart was half right on this. Also half wrong, but that's another, but that is a, another point. Last time we met, I called your attention to Karl Barth's passage on the genius and failure of the Roman mass, didn't I? He called it a religious masterpiece the high watermark in the development of the history of religion and the myths of no rival. And Karl Barth says, that's just what is wrong with it because religious masterpieces are one thing and Christian faith is something else. And the key term we talked about last time was obedience. Uh, worship is not to be thought out from the view of solemnity, beauty, drama, education, psychology, mystery, and so on, but as a matter of obedience to Christ and his gospel. And there, uh, Bart is just like hell. And I want to mention now another way that Bart was like hell. And that is in the whole question of natural theology. Calvin rejected natural theology. That is, a theology 
which goes ahead on its own without any reference to Scripture or Revelation. Arguing from the design of nature or whatever you want to have. And the whole reform movement is against that, and Bart is against it, and one of the examples I want to give you from this is in Bart was offered was the chance to give the Gifford Lectures. Have you ever heard of the Gifford Lectures? In fact, the one who's giving the Gifford Lectures now is Yaroslav Pelikan from Yale. This is one of the most prestigious of all lectureships in the world. Wasn't Reinhold Niebuhr there? And Reinhold Niebuhr yeah. gave the Gifford Lectures yeah. out of this, what, came the nature of the sure. man. Yeah, and Paul Tillich. And Paul Tillich, too gave the different lectures. It's in Scotland, one of the most prestigious lectures uh, that one can have. And Bart was invited to give these lectures in 1937 and 1938. But there was a problem, and the problem illustrates Bart and Calvin. Lord Gifford, who came up with the money to start these lectures, who had died in 1887, left a will with two unambiguously clear requirements in regard to the lecture to be held. One, the lecture shall have as their subject natural theology. In the widest sense of the term, a science of God, of the relations in which the world stands to God, and of human ethics and morality. This science, said Lord Gifford, is to be constructed independently of all historical religions. Hmm. It's not to be based upon Christian revelation or Buddhist revelation or Muslim revelation or Jewish revelation or any other kind of revelation. It's supposed to be done without that, independently of all historical religions and religious bodies. And, he said, is a strict natural science like chemistry and astrology. Hop diggity dog. Without reference to or reliance upon any supposed special, exceptional, or so called miraculous revelation. Revelation is out of it. You should really like Bart by the time we are through with this. You really should. You have to quite fair to him. Two, the Gifford Lecture shall serve the promoting, advancing, teaching, and diffusing of the study of such natural theology among all classes of society and among the whole population of Scotland. So Bart, a reformed theologian, gets an invitation to do this. And he writes the following. I certainly see, uh, with astonishment, that such a science as natural science, as Lord Gifford has in mind, does exist, but I don't see how it's possible for it to exist. I am convinced that so far as it has existed and still exists, it owes its existence to a radical error, that is, it's a mistake, he says in response to being invited to do this. As a reformed theologian, he wrote, I am subject to an ordinance which would keep me away from natural theology, even if I liked it, which I do not. If you want to say something? It's very important. Even if I like it, based on the religion of Allah, when the believer says so, he's rejecting his religion. the aim? The purpose of natural theology, according to the Bible, natural theology should have been a restoring, restoring the interest and the material condition, the material condition of human life, that is to say, social justice. This natural, enduring to the material side okay. of human being, the, the, the real kind means social concern and social life. So in the revelation, I would like to restore, I would like to find out that concern. Okay, 
And by the way, that comes right out of the Calvinism too. Because Calvin says, unlike the Anabaptists, that it is a Christian duty to engage in politics. Don't think your social action is something new. Nothing is new. No, nothing is new. But in fact, Calvin even referred to magistrates sometimes as gods. Astonishing statement. And everybody must get involved because the purpose is to change society. And uh, that comes out of the biblical revelation. So anyway, Bart says, as a reformed theologian, I'm subject to an ordinance which would keep me away from actual theology, even if my personal opinions incline me to it. So don't. It cannot really be the business of a reformed theologian to raise so much as his little finger to support such an undertaking in any positive way. And then he says, I am an avowed opponent of all natural theology. So Bart wrote to the Senate of the Universities of Scotland <laughs> to remind them, I am an avowed opponent of all natural theology. But the Senate of the Universities met, and the invitation was sustained. <laughs> and they wrote to Bart, come ahead anyway. And Bart, if I come, what am I going to say? Amazing. The invitation was sustained and Bart accepted. And then, after talking to Miles Saunders about the issue, uh, decided he would lecture on one of Miles' famous documents, the Scots Confession of 1560. That's true, the Miles business is not. Uh, this is a reformed confession from Scotland, 1560. I like this because Miles rather than like it. Imagine going to Scotland and then lecturing on the Scots Confession of 1560, which is completely different from natural theology. How did he do this? Bart had to explain himself. If natural theology, he said, wishes to achieve its end, it has to enter into controversy with a partner in opposition to whom it must make itself known. That is, sure, I'll go ahead and lecture on the Scots Confession to show you how different it is from natural theology. And the only way you'll know about natural theology is if you know what it's not. And then we'll find out if it is the truth. So that's what Barr did. He gave his lectures on the Scots Confession of 1560. Now, some of you will be interested in this, if I can find the book. But, uh, here it is. In this Donald K. McKinn book, for instance, there is a reform, a reformed writer. This guy is incredibly bright. He is a philosophical thinker. He comes out of a Dutch background. His name is Alvin Plantinga, P-L-A-N-T-I-N-G-A. And he has an article in this McKim book. The guy is so bright, he's hired to teach at Notre Dame. Teaching at Notre Dame. And in this book, he has an article called The Reformed Objection to Natural Theology. And uh, he explains it in a very interesting and lively way. And then in the same book, Donald Blosch, on page 386, also has an article called <coughs> Rosas Theology and Reform Theology on 386. And this really uh, struck me. You know, Mary, I didn't realize how bad process theology was. <laughs> uh, at least uh, Until you may. <laughs> at least in the comparison with Reform Theology, and I didn't realize that the process 
theologians. We're talking about Whitehead, and we're talking about John Cobb, down of Claremont, Charles Hartson, Charles Hartson, William, Daniel Day Williams, Daniel Day Williams, Hubert Ogden, Marjorie Shushaki, All of these, all of these people are process people, and their great enemy is what? Augustinian and Calvinistic doctrine on the side of the God, which they hate. It's 356. Very interesting point. This guy really expresses this in a very strong way. It is the Augustinian and Calvinistic doctrine of the sovereignty of God. That process theology is against. They are also against the irresistibility of grace. You can say no to grace. Well, I'm not sure if everybody could. I don't think Paul saw, thought that he could on the Damascus Road. If I had seen a show like that, I would have been converted immediately, too. If you can resist it, it's not great. How's that? Very good. <laughs> the irresistibility of grace. They also reject revelation as divine intervention. And just as Augustine and Calvin are the bad people of the past, so Karl Barth is regarded as the main threat at the moment. They like Thomas Aquinas insofar as he uses natural theology, but I don't think they really understand 